Hey guys, welcome back to another Rust tutorial. In this video, we'll be talking about ownership and borrowing. This tutorial will be a lot more visual than the previous ones because I'll be trying to illustrate how the memory is working and why Rust prevents certain things from happening. Rust's biggest feature is probably its ownership system, something I haven't seen in any other language and it fundamentally changes the way we program in it. But before we get into Rust's ownership system, we need some background on computer memory, more specifically the heap and the stack. If you're already familiar with these concepts, feel free to skip ahead. There are two parts of memory that is available to your program. The first is the stack, where the values are stored next to each other. Values on the stack are stored in the order they came in, and they're popped off in the opposite order that they came in. Let's go through an example. We have a visualization of our stack memory on the left, and our code on the right. In our main function, we declare three variables, x, y, and z. Then we assign x to 12 and y to 14. We see that x and y are next to each other in our stack memory. Then we assign z to be the square of x, which is 12. This requires a function call, so the value of 12 is pushed onto the stack as a parameter. Our function then pops 12 off the stack and squares it, and then puts it back onto the stack as a return value. Our main function then pops off that return value and stores it into our z variable. A key thing to understand is the computer must know the size of all the values we push onto the stack at compile time. In this case, we know for sure that U32 is 32 bits or 4 bytes in size. But this is not always the case. Almost always, our program needs to work with some arbitrary amounts of input. Say a program that keeps track of how many people signs up for an event. It could be 10 people, it could be 100 people, it could be 100,000 people. And our program needs to work for all those cases. This is where the second part of memory comes in, the heap. Values are sparsely scattered throughout the heap, so accessing these values require us to retain the memory address to them. And because in the heap values are not next to each other, it's great for storing values that grows. But one of the drawbacks to heap is it requires the program to do all the work. A program needs to request how much memory it wants, called allocating, and the program is responsible for deallocating that memory as well, or telling the computer that it no longer needs it. If a program continuously asks for memory without giving it back, the system will eventually run out of memory. Now when it comes to programming languages, it can usually be split into two categories, once with a garbage collector and once without. Languages like C, C++ lack a garbage collector, making them very fast and efficient. But developers need to be more careful when programming in them because they're responsible for allocating and deallocating the memory. Languages like Java, Python, Go, and JavaScript have a garbage collector, making them easier to work with. Developers can leave the heap memory management to the computer and focus on its application logic. While this is great for development, it falls short when the program demands performance and efficiency. The ownership system allows Rust to get the best of both worlds. By programming within a set of rules, at compile time, Rust is able to figure out exactly when memory regions on the heap need to be allocated and deallocated without the need of a garbage collector. The result of this is developers can focus on application logic, but at the same time produce fast and performant code. So there are three rules in Rust's ownership system. Each value in Rust has a variable that's called its owner. Each value must have exactly one owner, and when the owner goes out of scope, the value will be dropped, meaning the memory will be returned back to the system. Let's go through a program and see how it interacts with the stack and the heap. So in this program, we have our main function, and we call the printi function and assign its return value to a. Inside our printi function, we allocate a string with the values high and assign its owner as s. Then we mutate our string by adding an exclamation mark to it. Finally, we print it out and return s. So let's go through this program. Notice how the value high is allocated onto the heap. This is because this string type can grow and shrink. And we can see that on our next line where we add an exclamation mark to our string. Then we print our string out and return s. Since our print high function ended, everything related to it on the stack is popped off. Then its return value is going to be used by main and assigned to a. And notice how nothing changed with our heap value. This is because the ownership has been passed on from s to a. And now a is responsible for deallocating the heap when it goes out of scope. And we see that when our main function ends, A will go out of scope and the memory will be deallocated. Now let's go through a few programs that violates Rust's ownership system. Let's take a look at this program here. We have two strings, S1 and S2. We assign S1 to be a string hello world that resides on the heap. Then we assign S2 equal to S1. Finally, we print out S1 and S2. Let's see what the memory of this program looks like. First, we allocate some memory on the heap and store our hello world there. Then we push S1 onto our stack that points to our heap value. Then we push S2 onto the stack with the same value as S1. 
Then we print out our S1 and S2, and we get to the end of our code. But what happens now? When S2 goes out of scope, it's going to try and deallocate the heap value. Okay, so the heap value gets deallocated, but what about S1? When S1 goes out of scope, it's going to try and deallocate the heap value again. And now we're in the situation where the heap value was deallocated twice, which will cause the program to crash. Rust's ownership system prevents this from happening. Recall that we can only have one owner, so in this case, the original ownership was S1, but later on, it was passed on to S2. In Rust, when one ownership is passed on from one variable to the other, Rust marks the original variable as invalid. This way, when the variable goes out of scope, Rust knows not to deallocate anything. But this is also the reason why we get an error when we try to reference our S1 again. So how can we fix this? Well, one solution is we make a deep copy of S1 to S2. Now we have two owners to two variables and two heap values. But a deep copy isn't always needed. What if we just want two variables to access the same data? Well, that's where borrowing and references come in. Borrowing in Rust allows us to have multiple variables to access the same underlying heap data. A borrower simply borrows the value for a certain amount of time and never takes ownership of it. So let's go back to our program and change S2 to be a reference to S1, meaning it's borrowing the value of S1. What would that look like in memory? We have the same S1, but this time our S2 is just a memory address to S1. And when this program ends, we see that when S2 goes out of scope, nothing changes on the heap. And when S1 goes out of scope, the heap is deallocated once and only once. And when we try and compile this code, we see that it runs successfully. Let's take a look at another program. In this program, we're violating the same principle, except this time, rather than passing the ownership onto another variable, we've passed it onto another function. After our func1 function is complete, the value will be deallocated and we can no longer use it, which is why we get an error when we try to use s1 after the function call. And again, we can fix this by changing the parameter of our function from taking in the ownership of a string to a reference to a string. One last thing I want to talk about with Rust's ownership and borrowing system is how they interact with each other. One thing is that you can only have one mutable borrow at a time. And while that mutable borrow is happening, you cannot have any immutable borrows at the same time. This prevents things such as data races. In this program, we have S2 borrowing the value of S1, but then we try and change the value of S1 through a mutable borrow using the push stir method. And when we try and compile this program, Rust complains to us that we have a mutable borrow and an immutable borrow at the same time. There are many ways to fix this, and it really just depends on your application. Maybe you mutate it first, then get a reference, or you finish up using your immutable reference and then mutate it. Another one is a dangling reference, where we have a reference to some data that no longer has an owner. Well, that just means that the reference is no longer valid because it's pointing at memory that's already been deallocated. So Rust also prevents this from happening. Okay, that's all for this video. If you guys have any questions, leave a comment down below. If you think there's room for improvement, leave some suggestions down below. And I'll see you guys in the next video.